From harvest to production, I'm taking you on one of the most unique wine experiences in the world. And no, we are not in Italy, France, or Napa. Welcome to Colorado, to the new frontier for wine. So get ready for the ultimate Wild West adventure. We're going grapevine to glass at Carboy Winery. I'm here with Tyzak Wharton of Carboy Winery and Poppy Woody of the beautiful Cherokee Vineyard <laughs> that surrounds us. And we are going headfirst into the vines. This is quite a unique, a breathtaking and unusual space to grow grapes. How did you end up here? Um, I bought this land. There was fruit trees here and okay. I don't like ladders. Okay. <laughs> so um, they came out and grapes don't require ladders. That is very so true. that's how I got it. That's pure and simply it. <laughs> All right. So these are uh, Cabernet Franc. Mm -hmm. And they're beautiful. And so these are, are still in, in ripening mode. Uh, I would say they're, they're probably the majority of the way through ripening. You'll mm -hmm. probably be harvesting these probably what, the next two weeks. Probably another week. But you're welcome to, to taste. There are Thank seeds you. in there. OK. But again, <laughs> Cabernet Franc, very sweet. Beautiful acidity. The netting is on here to uh, it's a it's a uh, a bird prevention okay technique, which is quite smart. <laughs> it's beautiful and look at this tree. Yeah, Gorgeous. that was a little sapling when I moved in. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now look at it. Yeah. One thing I know I'm not an aficionado by any means in in grapes and wine, but. I always hear that the soil, the minerality, the climate has a lot of impact on the taste and flavor of the wine production. So from a Colorado perspective, how does the climate here shape the ultimate taste, if you will, of the wines? So uh, I, I've spent the majority of my winemaking career in California. The, the soil types there are much less uh, basic, much less alkaline than, than here. Um, so it is noticeable. Uh, it, it's seemingly- And what does that mean for, uh, for, for a non-science guy uh, like In, in layman terms, basic soils can sometimes breed vines that will be, that, that uh, will have uh, grapes that are, retain more acidity. Okay. So the acid profile is more- Okay, so uh, bitey. More, They're gonna be a little more bit- More pronounced. Okay. And so that there's, uh, there's that factor. Okay. And what should deal with in, this, in the cellar. Okay. But the climate here is being so rugged as it is, I would imagine you need a really hardy, rugged grape to be able to grow out here. Is that fair or no? It's quite site specific. I mean, you've had some uh, unique uh, experiments with uh, some other varieties. Yes, I have a tester row in row one where I planted a variety of different grapes just to see if I liked them, if they liked it here and if they'd grow. And because you never know. Right? I know that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's why I planted more Tempranillo and more of the Cab Franc. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Tempranillo seems to do well here in Grand Valley uh, in that it's, it's arid and, and the, the heat is retained. Okay. But then you also have the, the wind from the mouth of Dubec Canyon mm -hmm. that cools off in the evenings and, and creates a, a, a longer growing season, if you will. Is Tempranillo a grape native to South America or uh, Italy? It's, it's or? of Spanish origin. Spanish origin. Mm -hmm. yep. So European grapes grown here in Colorado. Correct. So yeah. you grow the input, you do the grapes, yes. and then Carboy Winery comes along and takes them and produces the wine. Yeah, That's so right. We've, uh, we've harvested uh, Gewürztraminer, uh, Viognier, and Tempranillo from this beautiful site. How do you actually harvest the grapes here? Do you use a machine or are they hand-picked or a combination? They are hand-picked. There's pickers that go through and they are right here at the cordon level okay. where the grapes are and they clip them off and put them in the totes. Hi. Hey. How, how are, are you? you? I'm Mark. Mark Burn. Burn, so good to meet you. So nice to meet you. Thanks for letting us invade your yeah. space. We're doing a little training here on these Tempranillos. These were planted four months ago, and we're like a year ahead on growth already. They've grown that fast. Yeah, so normally this would be happening after next season's growth, but we've already cordoned these. I went through these once before, four weeks ago, 
And so <clears throat> they're already initiated where they're going and all I'm doing now is bringing them to a terminal. And once we cut these, then all of these bud spurs, this one, see them growing here? Yes. That's next year's grapes. Then this next spring we'll cut all of these out. All of this will just be naked to the cordon and one each way. Pretty but there will be grapes next year or no? Oh yeah. This, this is a great bud spur for next year. There's your primary bud right there. There's your secondary, there's your tertiary. So what we like is to, when we prune in the spring after the freeze, we want that bud. That produces the biggest clusters, the healthiest clusters. If that one dies, we take the secondary. If that one's dead, we take the third one. Thank you, Vern. Appreciate You're it. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you yeah, for this hands-on. Good to meet, you, Good to meet yeah. you, Vern. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Alright, our adventure here in Colorado is continuing with Kaibab Sauvage and this is a view to die for and I cannot wait to check out the vineyard. And it doesn't look like we're doing it alone, right? Brought friends. <laughs> we, did, uh, we, did, <laughs> we did bring some, uh, some Riesling Thank you, grown Tizar. by the, uh, the gentleman to my right. Yeah, Excellent. This, this came out of our uh, Nielsen's vineyard last year. We did this Cheers. one. Cheers. 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 And this is delicious. Uh, Carboy did an amazing job finishing this. Balanced acidity. Beautiful touch day. Touch of sweetness. Beautiful day for it. It yeah, is a beautiful it day. Is. It's a beautiful walking. day for a walk. So, uh, Kaibab, you said junkyard. Tell me, <laughs> this looks like anything but a junkyard. <laughs> so, funny story, the guy who, who, who farmed this before me, farmed about 45 years when he bought it in the, uh, can't do math, 60s probably. This was old cars, tractors. It was just a junkyard. He cleaned it up. Um, made it all nice and, and put, a, put an orchard in. So this is East Orchard Mesa. It's kind of a bluff up above Palisade that's down here lower. And then down below is the Vinelands. And then over here, we call it the Valley Floor. And what's crazy is these are three super unique soil types that actually influence the type of grapes we plant and how we farm them. So this is melted snow, rain coming out of the Rocky Mountains. The reason this valley is green is because of the Colorado River. I mean, this wouldn't be here without it. This, we're high desert, we're 4,728 feet. We get 10 inches of rain a year. Um, everything would be that color of the book cliffs if we didn't irrigate. So the interesting thing, Kaibab, is that when I think of wines and I think of vineyards, right? I think Napa, I think Sonoma, I think France, I think Italy, but Colorado, I would never have thought that you'd have all of this in this Grand Valley. It's a pretty amazing microclimate. Um, you know, like I said, we're high desert, so we have low humidity, which is great for growing grapes. One of the biggest issues we have is disease pressure. And so we have, you know, the hot days and the cool nights, you hear it so much, but that diurnal shift keeps the acid retention where we're gonna ripen our grapes with that warm, the warm days and get the sugar accumulation. The diurnal shift being the, the temperature range from daylight to dark. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, your, your daytime high to your nighttime low. So up to a 40 degree shift sometimes. Wow. It's pretty amazing. Well, that's fantastic. And I want to see more about this adventure. So I think we should head down to the vineyard and check it out. Yeah. The view is spectacular up here, but I want to jump into those vines. Absolutely. All right, so now we are actually down in the vineyard, right, Kai Pab? Yeah, and we, we are. Because I want to check out what we have in that bottle of the Vin 59. Vin this 59 bad blend. boy right here. Vin 59 blend. And what's in the bottle? So we lost him. Two of the components come from this Tizan. vineyard. What's, what's oh, in the bottle? What, what's a, in it's there? It's a blend. It's a blend of Malbec, uh, Petit Verdot, Cab Franc, uh, a splash of Petit Syrah. So it's a, it's a, it's a Bordeaux blend, Bordeaux variety a blend. Bordeaux blend. It's yep. so good. There we are. Wow. Oh, wow. So Petit Verdot <gasps> gets its name. It's a Bordeaux, or a Bordeaux French red. You could see a small cluster, small berries. This is an undeveloped berry called a shot berry. It, what most people don't understand is how sweet wine grapes are. These are 25 bricks here, um, which means they're 25% Cheers. sugar. Cheers, guys. Cheers, man. Sorry. So when we sample these, mm. when we come out, ties that comes out, you got to, this isn't just enjoying the goodness of this grape. You're mm -hmm. actually learning. We're gonna we spit our more, seeds out. Plant more vines, right? We're looking at our seeds. 
We want that nutty brown character. See how that tip's just a little green? Mm -hmm. Not quite mature. Mm -hmm. So we're going to wait just a bit, even though our sugars are high enough. And then we're going to. So you can tell by looking at the seed. Oh yeah. Whether or not the grape is ready. Yes, indeed. The seed and the, and the flavor profile, the acidity level. Okay. You want to chew your skins too. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're going to get your tannins and your flavors from that, and exactly your acidity. Your acidity is going to hit the tip of your tongue. Boom. Cheers. Where's your wine? Uh, Left it back consumed. there. Consumed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Right, it's time to make some wine. We are at Carvoy in Littleton, and Tyzak is going to show me everything there is to making wine. Ready? Let's do it. All right. Oh, grapes are ready. So, Kevin, Jason. Kevin and Mark, nice good to meet you. I'm sorry, that was very rude. Jason, that's all right, Tyzak. I'm, I'm excited about these uh, grapes. My gosh, Verona. I love it. Okay. Developed by a gentleman uh, named Tom Ploker. He was trying to hybridize uh, grapes to withstand colder environments. Okay. So they're they're cold cold hardy uh, grapes, and they're called Verona. They were they were harvested in Palisade. Okay. Here, here in Colorado, you're welcome to taste them. They're, they're, yeah, uh, I'd love to. Small smaller uh, clusters. You can just bite right in there if you want. Get oh. out! Yeah. That is so cool. Oh. I got to do this. They do All have right. seeds, <laughs> mind you. Okay. Have seeds, so just grab a cluster, huh? Yeah. And so these cold hardy varieties typically have a higher uh, titratable acidity. Okay. So the acid level is a bit higher. And they're pretty small. Correct, yeah. Which is typical. So, so wine grapes are typically the size of blueberries. Really? Yeah, they're not like table grapes. Are you guys and they ready also have it? seeds. Again, seeds, I'm gonna remind you. Seeds, seeds. Are good for you. okay. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna have like seeds all over my teeth. Yeah. Right. Seeds. Hmm. So that bright acidity, we're, we're using this in a sparkling wine project. And so that acidity will, will help elevate that. Uh, and for color. So it's going to be a, a, a rosé, a brute rosé, if you will. Wow. It's sweet. It's juicy. Yep. And it's got that brightness. Yep. Awesome. Verona. And this is going to make a bubbly, a sparkling? That is correct. So this will be blended with uh, two other varieties. OK. Aramello and Mignol, okay. two white varieties. And so this is going to be the, the coloring material, if you will. So this is going to what? To, uh, make it into a rosé. Wow. Mmm. Dig it? It's really good. Yeah. It's light, pretty even, pretty balanced. Mm-hmm. It's really good. We just tasted that we're going to be dumping it in the bin and watching it up the day. Wow. This is so cool. A couple of years ago, we didn't have a bin dumper, and we literally had to pitchfork every single ton of grapes. And literally. in the sun, because we didn't have this overhang, which, you know, imagine doing that in 90 degrees. So, but yeah, they'll go up this conveyor belt and whole cluster go into the press behind you. And there'll be a whole cluster direct to press, so you'll get tannin from the seeds and the stems and the grape skins that normally you wouldn't get if we had completely distemmed them. Wow. Because here in Colorado, right? I mean, we saw the other day, right? Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, 90 degrees and then a foot of snow yeah. or whatever. And that's one of the reasons why in the Front Range, grapes don't grow as well as they do in the Western Slope, because the weather here and the climate here is vastly more unpredictable than in the Western Slope. But even in the Western Slope of Colorado, you deal with a year like last year, which was a very even growing year. This year, we had that string of hot days, which really is like putting everything in a microwave that's growing and everything ripens so much quicker. So when we talk about cold hardiness and viability of different grape strains, it's what can grow here and withstand the altitude, the close proximity to the sun, what can withstand uh, potential frost in uh, April or an early freeze in October, and what can handle that sun exposure. So that's why we experiment with varieties that are grown in some of those northern states. So if someone is familiar with the wines in Napa or Sonoma, mm -hmm. that's not what they're going to taste. It's important to talk about any wine, not just Colorado wine, European wine, um, South African wine, Napa wine. Wine depicts a sense of place. Uh, in this in this country, we tend to hold everything to the standard that California set, and so we tend to judge wines from Colorado and other places in the country to what wine tastes like in Napa, and that's not a fair comparison. 
Um, so we're gonna, we talk a lot here about understanding the context of the unique region that we're growing and how you can taste that in the wine and it's supposed to taste different and unique, so. That is so neat. It smells good too, It right? does it smell, smell like good. That's the smell of harvest right there. The trick is to not eat them all day. <laughs> yeah. Interesting, right? It just all goes in. Yep. The yep. grapes, the, the stems, the, stems, the leaves, the everything. Leaves, yep. everything. Depending on the wine that you're making, you may want it to be completely distemmed before it gets pressed. In this case, we want the stem inclusion and the seeds because that will lend itself to the, the tannic structure and, of the entire wine. Interesting. The only amount of time that this juice will be in contact with the skins, it's going to be in this press and then it's separated. Oh, really? Yep. All right, so the grapes just got dumped into, what is this called now, the tank or? So this is a bladder press. That canvas bladder on the, in, kind of on like the inside, inside. Uh -huh. this, okay. this material, it, it blows up and, and presses against, them against, that. against the against against perforated sides, yes. and yep. then the juice is going to drip. Yep, Correct. it's going to be uh, discarded into the, the, the juice pan in the bottom. That's very minimal really. skin contact. You can see how much color is coming out of that juice. Okay. So imagine if this was a very long extended it's press really cycle. Long. That's why how the grape gets that, the, the wine gets that wow. color. Whoa, look at yeah. that. So he's throwing dry, dry ice in there, and what that does is that adds carbon dioxide to the process, and that carbon dioxide will, will help kind of hold in oh. some of the aromatics that are wow. um, inherent in the grape. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go grab a, a little flask and we can taste the juice. Love it. Yeah. All right. It's just a little uh, lightly pressed juice. And so the longer it stays in the press, the darker this will get. Winemaking is science. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And nature. <laughs> There's some math involved, I found. <laughs> there I is math involved. Math was involved. I was like, yeah. oh, shit. Oh, that's really good. It's about good. decimal points. This is really good. Cheers. Hmm. Here's Nick. Hello, Nick. Explain what you're doing here, buddy. What's going yeah, on? Yeah, so basically, as you guys saw the press, after the juice, we take uh, you know, analysis of everything, making sure that the juice coming in is up to high qualities uh, and things like that. Uh, so basically, we take a little sample like this, just a little little guy right here, and we can run a full chemical analysis, make sure that the juice that we're getting is quality. And so that's our juice that's in there right now. Correct. We'll, we'll run it through a test. This is a, a spectrometer. Okay. And we can run and see basically how much nutrient is in there for the yeast how much, uh, you know, what's the pH, and uh, things like, you know, when it comes time for bottling, how mm -hmm. much sulfur is, so we're using the minimal amount of sulfur, okay. yet still getting the right uh, protection. Okay. Wine. Well, you really get your workout making wine, Tyson. Yeah, a little bit, right? Wow, the so, smell, so, smell so what he's so doing good. is resubmerging that cap. This, this wine is pretty much, uh, depleted the majority of its sugars. And so what's going to happen is that cap will eventually start to sink down because this, there's no more C viable CO2 being uh, produced. But right now he's, he's doing what, what might be the final punch down before it gets pressed. This is okay. going to be pressed uh, in the next 48 hours. So the juice is on the bottom and all these skins have risen to the top. Correct. And he's punching this down. Re and the, the purpose of, of remixing is rewetting the cap as you're extracting the the polyphenols, the anthocyanin, all the, all the flavor compounds. A lot of that's in the skin and you want to release that from the skins. <laughs> you want to give it a go? You want to try it? Sure, I could do that. All awesome. Right. All right. All right, I'm going to let you step up first. And all you do is pretty much just uh, resubmerge. There you go. Look, you, you oh, can yeah, say wow. you helped make this vintage now. I did, officially. didn't I now? As long as they don't become part of the vintage. 2020. <laughs> uh, we've had people fall in before. Yeah. <laughs> and, and depending upon the, the varying stages of fermentation, uh, it could be quite warm and, and, and nice, like a, like a warm bath. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And then now we'll show you how they do it in the, in the olden days, foot, foot treading. Oh boy. You want to try some foot treading? I think I'm getting in this tank, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. All right. So you, you just witness how do it modern days. We're gonna, we're gonna participate in, in doing the old old method. Oh, really? The antiquated method. Okay. Uh, 
it, but it, require, I, it requires a, a wardrobe change. Okay, am I, so am I dressed for this or? Uh, no, so we're gonna put, we're gonna outfit you in this, this uh, yellow attire. <laughs> wow. So, so get get this on and we'll, 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 put you, we'll throw you in a bed. We're going. I love Lucy. That's <laughs> awesome. Are good. you Lucy or am I Ethel or how's this gonna work? Uh, we have another gentleman that's gonna join you. All right. <laughs> Let's do this. I hope this fits. Is this a one size fits all? So this is where we like to, to get the, uh, the fermentations going. Okay. What you're gonna be jumping into after I get a, this bucket. Get is, out. Uh, Teraldigo. 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 Okay. So this is an Alpine uh, Italian variety that's grown in, in Palisade in Colorado, but it, its origins are, are North Italy. Italy. Yeah. Okay. So Toronto goes. Uh, we're gonna sanitize your feet. Okay. And get you in here. Okay. Cool. Oh boy. <laughs> this is awesome. Wow. And then just just wow. Tread, it's tread around. Deep and it's in my boot. Oh, is it already in it? You yeah. Uh, try to tape you up, man. You did try to tape me up. Sorry. I think you pulled one. Holy mackerel. Wardrobe change. You're doing what what is typically a punch down in the earlier stages. If, if we were to take a stainless tool and try to do this, it's not, it's not the, the, the great skin walls are not uh, decimated enough to, to actually Oh make my it easier. gosh, this is, to work out up a storm. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd rather just drink. <laughs> this is awesome. No, so you're, you're, uh, you're doing the I Love Lucy style. I see it. Foot treading. I definitely feel like Lucy, just not as pretty. All right. All right, so. <laughs> soaking wet. But drying <laughs> off, and now what are we in for? Uh, we're off. gonna take some finished wine, okay. or, or wine that's further along in the stage. Okay. Some wine in barrel that's uh, been uh, in barrel for about 10, 10 months, okay. roughly. Okay. Yeah, some Syrah from okay. uh, Grand Valley. All right, let's do it. I'm going to have you hold those. Awesome. All right. So, this little contraption is called a barrel thief. A barrel thief. Barrel thief. Okay. So you're 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 actually just because we're gonna steal some wine. Stealing some wine. Just goes in like that. Okay. Cover the hole with your thumb. It's like a baster, right? And I'm gonna give you a little sip there. Awesome. And so this is. Oh, wow. It smells Sir so good. Syrah out of barrel. I love Syrah. Yeah, this is the first, uh, 2019 was the first season we, we were able to work with uh, these vines. Okay. 30-year-old vines. Colorado. In Colorado, yeah. The and, nose is beautiful. So the longer it ages in barrel, uh, the, the softer the, the tannin profile becomes. Okay. You have that, the, there's a breathability through the pores of the barrel. Okay. And so it's kind of a micro-oxygen intake. And plant. these are oak? These are all oak, yeah. A lot of are, are, are neutral French oak barrels. Neutral okay. meaning they've been used so many times that there's no more uh, new integratable oak tannin or char because they, they char the inside of the barrel. It has a beautiful right? oaky yeah. nose to it. Right? I love it. Wow, is that delicious. It's really robust and um, the flavor is just incredible. So you get see now everything goes through the barrel and then the next stop is obviously it goes into a bottle okay or it goes into a keg so this oh, is wow. our wow <clears throat> look at this so this is our package goods the room keg room yeah <laughs> so everything we make we either get packaged in a stainless steel keg or in bottle which is traditionally how most people think of wine all right or it gets shipped, or, shipped in large format you know several hundred gallon totes uh like you'll see in our denver location so okay. we're gonna go yeah, there a little bit later and Great. check that out and this is something that we don't probably focus enough on when we talk about our story, the sustainability part of it. So um, when we started Carboy, we were focused we wanted to do something really fun and unique and innovating. And because this is a craft beer state, right? So everybody here is kind of ingrained to want tap products. So sure. we created a tap filling room of wine. So we have these stainless steel kegs that represent a lot of what we do. <clears throat> People come in and they can fill one liter growlers of wine there's just a huge sustainability factor there, reducing our carbon footprint, you know, for every K 
keg of wine, we're saving an entire case or two cases of wine that are, that's bottles that aren't going into landfills or recycling bins or that's corks great. that are being used. And so there's a huge, huge, and then when you go to Denver, you'll see that we don't even use yeah. kegs there. So yeah. this is winemaking with a conscience, yeah. right? Yeah. You have to, you know, it, wine comes from the earth and you need to take care of the earth in order to have yeah. a sustainable product and good wine. Time to taste some wine. I yeah. am ready to yeah. taste. We As made it, let's tasted. taste it. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's do it. <laughs>
as a paying tribute to miners of the 1859 Colorado Gold Rush and not having contents becoming of Colorado. Right. So this with this vintage right here in 2018, we rechristened it with as an all Colorado blend and then introduced in bin 49 for the California counterpart. Cheers. To the flagship. Cheers. To the Cheers. flagship wine. And it's very much ripe Bank Bordeaux style. I oh, mean, if you've noticed is. anything yeah. tasting all of our Woo. wines, we, we're not trying to make our wines taste like California wines. They're not rich and extracted and jammy. They're, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you know, if you're a grape whisperer, you know, the grapes out here to us, to Tizoc, Jason, myself, have always kind of, we felt, lent themselves more to French and old world yeah. style winemaking techniques. And so we want the wines to all be earth driven and lead with the terroir over the fruit. And I think that makes it very easy for us to make blends like this when all the grapes are singing the same language. And, and this one singing, let me tell indeed. you, it's got that Bordeaux-esque vibe, but lighter, jammy, Younger. but lighter, mm -hmm. it's delicious. Jason, Kevin, for the charcuterie experience, we are having what? This is our 2017 Cabernet Franc. This was actually our first 90 point rated wine, our most celebrated wine we ever made. And this was really the wine that really kickstarted that we needed to change our business model to focus on Colorado. Like this, this was the impetus of that happening. Colorado so, wine. Yeah. And he had to dive into the library for this one. So really? I had to, you can't I had walk to scale in and just order this one off the A street. mountainous <laughs> li uh, ladder to get it in a tight spot. Thank you. Jason. Thank you. Cheers. 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 I get olives, I get a little green pepper, but it's not an overwhelming green pepper. It's, it's, it's very subdued. And then it has those lovely, like, macerated cherry notes that I, makes me think of Cap Franc. a little tobacco. Yeah. A little totally. Tobacco. Totally. A little tobacco, some stewed plums. Yeah. yeah. Look at that. Wow. That is a charcuterie platter. Yeah. So, and, and Chef cures his own meats here. So we've got a house-made speck and a copa, and then this is a grass, fed grass, finished uh, uh, chi, aged cheese, and then we have an aged brie. It's beautiful. Yeah. And then a little accoutrements there. So, you know, some cornichon, some stuffed grape leaves, some whole green mustard seed, uh, some uh, cauliflower, uh, and then a little, little Peruvian curls, it's little beautiful. sweet little dewdrops. They look like they're gonna be hot, but they're, they're super sweet and delicious. You know, one of the things that I love about wine and the whole wine experience is when you enjoy it with the charcuterie platter and you have the, the meats and you have yeah. the cheese, because I feel like the wine takes on a whole different complexity when you pair it with the cheese. Yeah, it does. And, and that's, it's that, go, it's that whole, what grows together goes together kind of mantra. And, mm. and so there's this, there's this beautiful thing that just happens when you eat this really amazing, complex, intense cheese or aged wow. meat and then pair it with the wine and they play off each other back and forth. It brings out nuances in the wine. This is incredible, Kevin. Yeah. What, is, what is this cheese again? It's a grass-fed and grass-finished aged cheese. So wow. All right, well, we are going to now talk all about meat. We were with wine, and we are with Chef Scott, who puts together one mean charcuterie platter, and I want to learn all about the meat. We built this curing room last winter, and we've been working our way into it slowly, getting up to speed, and um, we should begin harvesting some products that we could use here in the wineries in the next couple of months. Now this, uh, Scott, is not something that's easy to do, right, curing meat. I mean, this, this is a process. It is a process. I don't want to say it's not easy to do, because as I want to come in here? Sure can. Um, but in, oh to, do it, wow. to do it to an to do it to an extent where someone would be willing to pay for it is what separates uh, home charcuterie from professional charcuterie. So we started off with uh, with pancetta tessa. Pancetta tessa is the pork belly that is cured. The first step of most charcuterie is a curing, which is done in cold temperatures. So um, this is done with salt, some curing salts, and then it is it's cured for about 25 to 35 days. And then we move it into here to allow it to begin to ferment, not ferment, but to actually um, dry age in this room. This is the dry aging room, curing room, as opposed to the um, actual cold curing, which is the process that precedes this step. 
The smells in here are so complex. So we have the soprasada, we have the pork belly, right? Pancetta tessa. The pancetta tessa, and up above we have that's brisola. Oh my brisola. That gosh. is done with bison. Wow. Um, so a local local raised bison. Oh, love it, Scott. Thank you. You're very welcome. This is really incredible. You should be very proud. Thanks. This is quite quite the project. I'm glad you got to come check it out. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so Jason, we are now in Denver, headed to Carboy Denver. Carboy Denver. For a different experience. Carboy at Governor's Park. Carboy so, at Governor's so Park. Slide on into the barrel room. All right, the barrel room. Yeah. Wow, look at this. It's pretty awesome. There's a lot going on in here. Now so, what's in here? So these are, these are 300 gallon bright tanks. And uh, we were talking about sustainability before and the fact that kegs, you know, are also a little bit hard to, to go get and fill and all that. Uh, so here in Denver and in Breckenridge, we put in a bright tank system, stealing from the beer world. Okay. And so we bring the, we bring the wine up in these totes. So the wine comes here yep. in this tote. All yep. right. And then we, we, we pump it in, filter it as we, as we put it in goes in there and then kind of like Willy Wonka, it goes up into the air Get and out. feeds all three bars. Really? This, this is the Malbec. So this is a 2016 Columbia Valley. Okay. And it came to us, uh, you know, it came to us a year wow. or two ago. Uh, we blended and finished it ourselves. And then uh, it's it's been on draft here at Gulls Park since we opened back in uh, back a year ago, almost to the day. Excellent. So I can't we're gonna out. We're gonna pull a little bit of wine off of that tank. Okay. And then we're gonna go over and we're gonna try the cask Malbec that aged in the Hungarian oak. And we're going to compare them side by side to see if we can pick up some, some, some Love subtle it. differences. Love it. Yeah. Go ahead, put your glass right in there. Wine out of a 300 gallon bright tank. Cheers, Salute. cheers to cheers. that. Salute. Mm, that's good. It's really good. Yeah, typically we only use Woo. this for uh, sampling so that we can do testing. You know, this is so, great. But it is a pretty easy access. Little, Very easy you know, access. A little dangerously <laughs> easy, you know. So save a little bit of that. Okay. Because we're gonna, Let's we're, do gonna the taste. we're gonna go get okay. that cast small back, which we just bottled, and we're gonna pop that open. This is a, a 12 hectoliter. Wow. Which is a little over 300 gallons, uh, Hungarian oak. Look how pretty that is. It's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And easy. Just get that last drop. <laughs> <laughs> I is. did, I got it. There it is. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Ooh, wow. That's like a snack. That is that really, good? really interesting. And that's young. It'll it's be delicious. In It'll be in there for it's quite a bit It's young, longer. but it is delicious. Yeah. It's, got, it's got good potential, and, and uh, we're excited about it. Yeah, we're going to go check out our bubble barn now. It's hard so, to say that fast. The bubble barn. The bubble barn. The bubble barn. Yeah. And is this where the bubbles happen? They're, where they will happen. Where they will happen. So these tanks are really the next step in the evolution of our sparkling wine program. We started with a few small uh, runs of sparkling wine up in our Breckenridge location. You had the VAV, which was you know, 2.0 down in, down in uh, Littleton. And then this is gonna be 3.0. So this, these are Charmat tanks, and they're essentially, uh, you would know, Prosecco. Prosecco right. gets, gets made in tanks like these. Really? Look at these tanks. This is incredible. Pretty cool, yeah. So, so we'll make the base wines down in Littleton. Okay. In Verona, Okay. That you saw today. We'll blend that Verona with two more, uh, two more whites. Okay. And that's that VAV, Verona, right. Vignoles, and Arabella. Okay. So and these tanks, they carbonate the, the wine. Okay. So there's. Two, there's a couple different ways that you can make sparkling wine, but the two main ones are Charmant method, which is how Prosecco is made typically, and then uh, your, your uh, method traditional or method ancestral or method champenois, which is how they make champagne. So we can't call it champagne because we're in the States. Right. This will really be the, the backbone of, of the wine that we'll, we'll, be, we'll be able to make enough to actually get out to the people on a regular basis. This is fantastic. Yeah. What a, a unique fun. space. It's, it's as unique here. as the wine. Yeah, indeed. But it's been here since the 1800s. It was a, an old barn. It was utilized by the constables 
and uh, and has you know had many different uh, many different lives up until now, and I think that we're doing it some justice. I hope it looks and pretty awesome. And now people will enjoy bubbles yeah. in the bubble barn. In the bubble barn. Well done. Say that two more times. Yeah, <laughs> I think I made it, barely made it the first <laughs> time. So the growlers. Carboy growlers. Yes. And this is where people can take carboy home with them, right? Yeah. Outside indeed. of just getting it in the bottle, they can come in and fill their growler yeah. up. Yeah. People were already used to filling up growlers of beer, so it was a great opportunity to, to do the same thing, but with wine, right? So we have these one liter carboy growlers, so a okay. liter, about a glass and a half more than your ever regular bottle. So, okay. you know, more wine is always better. Uh, but yeah, they, they, uh, they purchase the growler and then they pick the wine and all the wines are different prices depending on, on which, and they fill uh, it up and, and take it home. just fill it up right here yeah. and take we, it home. And we do the filling, but they do the, they right. do the drinking. Yeah. This is very we take cool. it home. Jason. This has been the most incredible experience here today at Carboy. It has been. Really, it's been a great, I mean, great day. From grapevine in the vineyards in Grand Valley to now filling my own Carboy, this is an experience you guys have to check out. When you're in Denver, Carboy Winery is a don't miss.